In the next few minutes, I hope to give you a new perspective on the critical topic of energy. This short video explains what energy does for us, why we can't do without it, and from where we will get it in the future. Climate change, of course, has been dominating the energy conversation. I'm a believer that man is contributing to climate change and concur that we need to reduce our carbon emissions. However, the public push has been primarily focused on banning fracking and eliminating the production of oil and gas. That is dangerously backwards. The focus needs to be on reducing our use of carbon energy first. Even electric vehicles still run primarily on carbon energy. And until we quit needing oil and gas, it would be devastating not to have the fuel available. So let's take a realistic look at the importance of energy in our lives and the challenges we face with an uncertain energy future. The bitter rhetoric portrays carbon energy as evil, which isn't a fair assertion. The truth is, carbon energy is the underappreciated workhorse that brought us out of the dark ages. Before the steam engine was invented in the early 1700s, you were the source of energy. If you wanted something, you made it. If you wanted to eat something, you grew it or killed it. There were 600 million human beings on the planet, and life expectancy was a mere 29 years. Today, on the other hand, one farmer can feed thousands. And with clean running water, electricity, a warm home, and medical discoveries made possible by energy, the average life expectancy in the U.S. is now close to 80. But now that we can feed the masses and everybody lives much longer, we have 7.5 billion people making 15 billion footprints all over the planet. And every single person needs energy to survive. So given the dilemma of climate change, from where is all that energy going to come? Let's first put a reliance on energy in perspective. Most have seen the science exhibit where a bike turns a generator and lights up a light bulb. Can you imagine how many people it would take to light up your house, the air conditioner, washer and dryer, all the TVs and computers? And if you think gasoline is too expensive, put a gallon in your car, drive it till it runs out, then push it back. At $10 per hour, the equivalent cost for man to do the work would be $5,000 per gallon. Further, petroleum is the base material for many of our needed products, from clothing and medical supplies to makeup and toothpaste. The bottom line is that energy is cheap and it makes our lives awesome. The reality is that energy use has not ruined the planet, but has actually led to a cleaner environment. The foulest living conditions on the planet are where people have little, if any, access to energy. In addition, our economy is tied directly to our energy use. Based on GDP per capita, America is five times as productive and five times as wealthy as the bulk of the world. However, it takes five times as much energy to run that economy. That is because literally everything you have and everything you do takes energy. Even a cotton t-shirt was farmed with diesel tractors, milled in a natural gas powered factory, and trucked to a department store where you drove in your car to buy it. The bottom line is that our lives as we know them are 100% dependent on energy. The world will continue to need more energy. As the standard of living improves in the third world, it will be on the back of increased energy use. So back to the question at hand. Given mankind's insatiable need for energy, from where will it all come? In the U.S., approximately 80% of our current use is from carbon energy. If that is going away, then it needs to be replaced by other sources, because again, we aren't going to quit using energy. Let's first talk about the minor energy sources that are not the solution. Geothermal has low energy density, still requires drilling wells, and is limited to locations where hot rocks are near the surface. Therefore, geothermal has very limited application. Hydro is not the solution. The environmentalists don't want to dam natural rivers, and when you do, the trees that are flooded out eventually rot, emitting lots of CO2. Biomass has the lowest energy density of all energy sources, and thus requires huge amounts of land. Further, the process still generates CO2 emissions. Therefore, there is limited room for growth in biomass. The developing technologies of fuel cells and hydrogen energy will play increasingly important roles in delivering energy in the future. However, both currently rely on methane as a feedstock, so emissions would be reduced but not eliminated. Hydrogen could also be generated from water versus methane, but the process takes much more energy than it produces, so it is not currently viable. The bottom line is that the mainstream public has been sold the fantasy that we can rely on wind and solar, which currently make up less than 5% of our energy production, to replace fossil fuels and to provide virtually all of our future energy. Unfortunately, despite the rosy picture advocates may paint, wind and solar are not even close to being feasible as standalone energy sources on a grid scale. In his book, How to Avoid a Climate Disaster, Bill Gates discusses the multiple drawbacks that will ultimately limit the applicability of wind and solar. The most significant issue is the curse of intermittency. 
The first form of intermittency is the difference between day and night. As a result, they have a capacity factor of approximately 25% for solar and up to 35% for wind. That means that if a city requires one gigawatt of power over a 24-hour period, one gigawatt of solar, for example, would only provide 25% of what is needed, with the other 75% having to come from backup generation sources. If you wanted to provide 100% of the energy with solar, then you would have to build four gigawatts of capacity that would run 25% of the time. Requiring batteries or some other storage system to store 75% of the energy to use when the generation is offline. That's the best case scenario on a sunny summer day. It gets worse because the second form of intermittency is the difference between summer and winter, particularly for solar. Germany, for example, uses a lot of solar. The solar output is 90% higher in the summer than the winter because of the tilt of the earth and the length of the days. Storage can't currently solve that problem. Only backup generation can. The final form of intermittency is related to extreme weather events lasting several days where wind and solar may not be available at all. Gates points out that if Tokyo were hit with a typhoon that shut it down for three days, it would require 14 million large-scale batteries, more than the world produces in a decade, at a cost of 400 billion to store three days of power needs. Again, the only feasible solution would be backup generation. After intermittency, the second drawback of wind and solar is the need for storage technology that does not currently exist. Of all the storage options available, lithium-ion batteries are still the best. However, there is no existing grid-scale battery storage on the planet that can do any more than help cover a few hours of evening peak demand. Aside from the fact that the U.S. is reliant on big ugly mines in third world countries for our supply chain, the major problem with lithium-ion batteries is that they are not very energy dense meaning it takes a lot of them to hold much energy. For example, Gates notes that gasoline is 35 times more energy dense than batteries, meaning to replace 10 gallons of gasoline weighing 60 pounds would require 2,100 pounds of batteries. That is why there are no commercial electric planes, ships, or long-haul vehicles. Research is being done on alternative approaches to storage, but all have significant disadvantages and none are applicable on a broad basis. The reality is that the grid-scale storage needed for a 100% wind and solar world is nowhere close to being feasible with current technology. A third major obstacle of wind and solar is the amount of surface land needed. According to Gates, replacing a natural gas generation facility with solar could take up to 500 times the surface land, and replacing it with wind would take up to 5,000 times more surface. Even if a storage miracle occurs and it becomes technically feasible to do so, the amount of land needed for a full-scale build-out of wind and solar would be mind-numbing. One final challenge of wind and solar is the collection and transmission of the electrons. Most of the U.S. sun is in the southwest and the wind in the Great Plains, far from any major urban areas. To solve this problem, we will have to crisscross the country with thousands of miles of high-voltage power lines. But the political hurdles are considerable as merely picking the routes, establishing the right-of-ways, and passing environmental scrutiny for a single line can be a massive undertaking. The bottom line is that wind and solar are not the end-all answer. At most, they can theoretically supply 25 to 30 percent of our energy needs before grid stability becomes an issue. And even then, you better have 100 percent backup from other energy sources. Which brings us to the only technically feasible answer for a carbon-free future, nuclear. As Gates says, nuclear is the only carbon-free energy source that can reliably deliver power day and night through every season anywhere on Earth that has been proven to work on a grid scale. Compared to wind and solar, nuclear uses only a fraction of the space and requires only a fraction of the concrete, steel, and plastics, which, as Gates explained, have their own carbon footprint. Further, Nuclear can be located close to the demand centers, avoiding the massive transmission losses associated with gathering and delivering wind and solar electrons. According to Gates, the drawbacks of nuclear are A, the fear of an accident, and B, disposing of the nuclear waste. Both of these issues can be addressed. The reality is that in deaths per unit of power generated, nuclear is the safest source available, and none of those deaths have been on U.S. soil. Note that the three major nuclear accidents were all at facilities built 40 to 50 years ago. The latest nuclear design is fully automated, eliminating the possibility of human error, and is engineered so that it can't melt down based on the laws of physics. Further, it can use nuclear waste from current facilities as fuel. In the future, just like the suds and ships of the U.S. Navy, 
I foresee numerous micronuclear plants located close to the urban centers where the energy is needed. But the transition to a primarily nuclear world is not going to happen overnight, especially since the public focus is currently sidetracked on pursuing wind and solar. Ironically, even with record recent investments, wind and solar's share of the market is increasing slowly and still provides less than 5% of our total energy supply. In fact, more emissions have been eliminated by switching from coal to clean burning natural gas than to renewables. At the rate wind and solar are growing, it will still take decades to max out in the 25 to 30 percent of capacity range, the point at which grid stability becomes an issue. But unfortunately, until the reality of the practical limitations of wind and solar set in, only then will the focus shift to nuclear, which will then take decades more to develop. In the meantime, despite the efforts of carbon opponents to ban fracking and eliminate domestic production, we still need carbon energy. Ironically, the opponents focus on production when consumption is the real issue. If domestic production is banned, we will still need to fly airplanes, fill our cars with gas, and heat our homes. Therefore, the same number of wells still need to get drilled somewhere to provide that energy, probably somewhere with much less stringent environmental practices than in the U.S. Then the product will be put on a ship and delivered to our shores, which presents its own environmental risk. In the meantime, the capital investment, the jobs, and the royalties and taxes would all go to other countries. This would not only increase our trade deficit and national debt, but would also erode our national security by making the U.S. reliant on other countries for our energy. New York is living proof. The state banned fracking in 2015, even though the state sits over the prolific Marcellus Shale. Five years prior to the ban, the state consumed an average of 1.26 trillion cubic feet of natural gas per year. In the five years after the ban, the state has continued to consume an average of 1.26 TCF per year, virtually unchanged. Instead of allowing the development of their own gas reserves, New York has continued to import the fuel from neighboring Pennsylvania, to whom they have exported the economic benefits. What they did not export were the emissions associated with consuming the fuel which will not go away until there is a viable alternative. In closing, let me briefly summarize the major takeaways from this video. Number one, climate change is happening and mankind needs to take action to reduce its emissions. However, we need to proceed based on facts, not on emotions. We've done the science on climate change. Now we need to do the math on the solution. Number two, despite the threat of climate change, mankind is not going to reduce its energy use. If anything, we need more of it than ever. Number three, regardless of government mandates for renewables, wind and solar will never be reliable and independent energy sources. You can't mandate math and physics that don't exist. Number four, the answer to a carbon-free energy future is nuclear power. If the world is serious about climate change, then it needs to get serious about nuclear. And number five, in the meantime, we still need carbon energy and in particular, clean burning natural gas, the bridge fuel of choice. And if we still need oil and gas, then the best place to produce them is here in the United States, where we can control the environmental safeguards and keep the significant economic benefit right here at home. At the end of the day, mankind is a pretty scrappy animal, and I have no doubt we'll figure it out. So if you're worried about our murky future, remember this. It is way better than it was in the 1700s. The End of this video anyway, if not the debate. Thank you for watching this video and if you feel the message is important for sharing it with others. Please like and subscribe to my YouTube channel where you can find other educational videos on energy. It is certainly a topic worth your time and effort to understand.